Dr. Tarek, good evening and assalamu alaikum to everybody. And thank you very much for, for staying with me for the past seven days. It's been a real pleasure. And I think I'm going to miss you all. And my evenings have been so well entertained with you all. So what I'll do is I'm going to go straight into the last lecture and I'm going to switch my video off. So hopefully the connection will be a little bit better. So I'll stop my video and I shall share my screen with you all. Can all see that? Excellent, great. Okay, so what we're going to do now for the next hour or so, I'm going to tell you about the investigator obligation, obligations. Everything we've talked about so far is an investigator obligation, the safety reporting, IP handling, source documentation, but there are loads of other practical things we need to consider as well. And this is what I am going to talk about now. So the objectives we have, first of all, hopefully you'll understand the definition of what is an investigator, who can be an investigator, and then I'm going to introduce you to the term sub-investigator. And then we will look at the roles and responsibilities of the investigator as per ICH GCP. So before we do that, like always, let's do a little bit of a recap. If we go back to the principles of GCP, principle 2.7 states the medical care given to and the, and the decisions made on behalf of a subject should always be the responsibility of a qualified physician or an appropriate a qualified dentist. So medical care is very important. Yeah? Then it goes to say each individual involved in conducting a trial should be qualified by education, training, experience to perform his or her respective tasks. Now, this is a very important principle, and you are all attending these seven lectures to meet this principle if you are going to be involved in clinical research. So the medical care, making sure all the study team is qualified, is the responsibility of the investigator. So having said that, ICA GCP section 4.6 defines the role of the invest investigator themselves in detail. So the investigator. Who is the investigator? Well, the investigator is a person responsible for the conduct of a clinical trial at a tr trial site if a trial is conducted by a team of individuals at a trial site. The investigator is the responsible leader of the team and may be called the principal investigator. So the investigator is a person responsible for the conduct of the clinical trial. And they will lead a team, they're the responsible leader of the team. Sometimes we call them principal investigators. So this is what whoever meets this criteria, who's taking responsibility for the conduct of the trial, they are the investigator. Then you have the definition of a coordinating investigator. This is, what is a coordinating investigator? Well, this is an investigator assigned the responsibility of the coordination of investigators at different centers in a multi-center clinical trial. So if you have a multi-center clinical trial, that means that many centers may be in one region and each center has an investigator there can sometimes be an investigator who's, who's assigned as the coordinating investigator, who will just coordinate some of the activities. Oops, oops. Then you have the definition of a sub-investigator. A sub-investigator is any individual of the clinical trial team who's designated and supervised by the investigator at a trial site to perform the critical trial related procedures and to make important trial related decisions. So at a site you'll have an investigator and then anyone who's doing this critical trial related procedures or making important trial related decisions, they are going to be deemed as a sub investigator. And in the majority of cases, the sub investigator is actually medically qualified as well. So we have an investigator, we have the sub-investigator. Then you have someone who's identified as a sponsor investigator. 
So what is a sponsor investigator? And this is what it is. It's an individual who both initiates and conducts alone or with others a clinical trial and whose immediate direction the investigational product is administ administered to, dispensed to, and used by the subject. So an individual who initiates conducts the trial as well. So the term does not include a person other than an individual. For example, it doesn't include a cooperation or an agency. So what does this actually mean? So let's say, for example, you're, invest, you're, a, you're a doctor, you're working in an institution, and you want to do some research on a marketed product, for example. And the products are on the market, but you want to test it in a trial, and you, you, then you, because if you want to do your study, there's no sponsor for it, you take on the role of a sponsor as well. So you're called a sponsor investigator. How does that impact you? Well, in that case, you will follow section 4.0 investigator responsibilities, and you're responsible for the sponsor responsibilities, which are outlined in section 5.0. So in this case, what it means, if you remember yesterday, especially when it comes to safety reporting, the sponsor has to send SUSARs to the regulatory authorities. As an investigator, you report SAEs only to the sponsor. So if you become a sponsor investigator, then then task, then that task of reporting, for example, the SUSA to the regulatory authority will become your role. Okay, so that is what a sponsor investigator means. So all in the, the previous slides, when I talked about the principles, the two principles of GCP and, and an investigator G, obligations, they're all outlined in section 4.0 very very clearly 4.0 next so now let's delve into our own investigator obligations into a lot of detail so investigator obligations according to gcp the investigator should be qualified by education training and experience to assume responsibility of the proper conduct conduct of the trial the important word here is education and training we are providing you the training. The experience you may not have, but you can build on that experience. The sponsor can help you with that. They will monitor you. So you have to make sure. You also, you have to meet all the qualifications that are specified by the applicable regulatory requirements. So if your regulatory requirements state that all investigators have to be medically qualified, then they have to be medically qualified. And also you must provide evidence of your qualifications through a CV or any relevant documentation that the IRB would want to see and the sponsor or regulatory authorities. So what happens if you do an international phase two, phase three type of trial, when the sponsor comes to you to ask your interest, see if you're interested in the study or not, they will ask you for your CV. That CV is an essential document. So it's one of the essential documents, very important. When you do a submission to your IRBs, one of the documents they want is your CV, because according to section three, the IRB has to approve the investigator as well. And they wanna make sure you're qualified, you're trained. And one thing they will look at is, where is your GCP training? So what else? Well, obviously, you must be familiar with the protocol. You must be familiar with the investigator's brochure. So when you're running this study, you have to make sure you understand the protocol, what's required, and you understand the background of the drug. And very importantly, you must be aware of and comply with good clinical practice and regulatory requirements. So you should know that if in my country I am doing clinical research, yes, I know what GCP is now because names told me, told me but what are my country regulatory requirements? That you need to understand as well. As an investigator, clearly GCP says you are going to allow auditing by the sponsor. You will allow inspections by the regulatory authority if they need to do that. You will allow the sponsor to come and monitor you. And when we did source documentation, essential documents, I told you what monitoring was. Now, Another very interesting document. 
one thing that you have to do is you must maintain a list of appropriately qualified persons to whom you have delegated significant trial related duties. Now, what this is, is in every clinical trial, there's another document, another essential document called the site staff signature sheet or the delegation log. And as an investigator, what you will do is on this, you will write down whoever is, who are the people in your study team? Like you may have a doctor there, a nurse there, a study coordinator, whoever, and what do they actually do? So for example, the physician will do medical assessments. They'll do physical examinations. The nurse, for example, may complete the CRF, maybe taking the blood pressure. All of this clearly has to be documented. And the reason for that is because we want to ensure that anyone who's working with the clinical research is a, on a clinical trial is appropriately qualified. Now, yes, you can do the clinical trial, but it's very good. But what GCP says is, you know, if you're going to do the clinical trial, you must have the adequate resources. And one of the most important things is subjects or patients. You must have enough subjects or you must demonstrate a potential for recruiting the subjects in the recruitment period. So, for example, when the sponsor comes to you and say, look, we want to do this clinical study. We want, say, 10 patients from you. Can you give them to us in two months, for example? And they will ask you, do you know, have you done any studies before? And you can tell them, yes, and I did this recruitment. If not, you be very transparent with them that, yes, you know, we do have a patient database, but you cannot show any patient databases to any sponsor at all. Yeah? You tell them this. They'll ask you for this. And very importantly, you must have the time to complete the study. If you notice or you realize doing clinical research to GCP standards takes a lot of time. There's a lot of documentation to involve. You have to follow the protocol. There's lots of reports that need to be sent and it will take your time. So you must say, yes, I have got the time or I don't have the time to do this. On top of that, you must have a number of adequately qualified staff as well as facilities. So do you have the facilities? If we need specialized, for example, procedures done, can they be done at your site? If they can't, where will they be done for, for the subject, for the clinical trial? And you, are very, and you are responsible for informing all of your staff about the protocol and the investigational product and all their trial related duties. So it's very important when you're an investigator, you set up a team, you tell them, you train them, you ask the sponsor to help you train them on this. What we want is individuals in the team who fully know exactly what their roles and responsibilities are and what and how to follow the protocol. Important point here is as an investigator, you are ultimately responsible for everything that happens in the clinical trial. You are responsible, you can delegate the tasks, but you must supervise. You must supervise those people whom you have delegated your trial related duties to. So very importantly, touch base with your start trial staff, ask them how are things going, perhaps let them provide you updates, observe them, see what is happening. So that's a little bit about from the practical aspects. Now the medical care of the subjects, GCP clearly states a qualified physician or dentist is responsible for all the trial related medical decisions. And if it's dental for the dental, if it's a dentist for a dental decision. All medical care of subjects, you must ensure that there's adequate medical, medical care for adverse events or any issues, safety concerns that happen in the clinical trial. And this is something when the IRBs are going to be reviewing your protocol, they will see how are you providing this medical care? How will you inform subjects when if there's a serious issue that may happen? What is the medical care going to be like? You are taking the responsibility of doing this. Now, also interestingly, GCP states that it is recommended from the sub to inform the subject's primary physician about the subject's participation in the trial and if the subject agrees to actually inform the primary physician. So yes, we recommend you if the subject is going to be in the clinical trial and they have like a GP, a general practitioner or a physician, primary physician, inform them, but only if the subject allows you to do that. 
we need to maintain respect the subject's decisions, uh, uh, rights in the decisions. And one of the reasons why this has been mentioned is, for example, you may have subjects who, have H, who are HIV positive. Their family don't know, their GPs don't know, but they've gone, gone in a clinical trial. So we have to be very sensitive as how we handle this as well. And also one thing to remember, and this was coming from consent, is that the subjects are allowed to withdraw any time they want. At any time point in the clinical study, they say we wish to withdraw, they're allowed to withdraw. But what GCP says is you try to make every reasonable effort to understand why they're withdrawing. You know, was it a safety? concern what are they not happy and why are they withdrawing are the study procedures too inconvenient we need to know these things so what it says is make a reasonable effort to get the reason but respect the rights they're fully respecting the rights of the subjects if they don't want to give us a reason we cannot force anything out of them but usually subjects will tell us why okay. so now a little bit of recap if you remember communicating with the IRBs one thing we have to have one of the investigators' obligations is, is to assure that the IC, that the IRB or the IEC is in compliance with ICH GCP. As I mentioned to you in our IRB section, the IRBs have to meet section three of the GCP guidelines. And to get that assurance from them that they are in compliance with GCP, we will ask for them, we'll ask them for a statement from them. A statement that says this IRB is constituted in accordance with good clinical practice and local regulations. And usually this statement is on their approval letter, which they'll give you for all research. Remember, your discussions with the IRB are not just initial, but it's ongoing. And remember, yeah, I did tell you the type of reports you need to send them from the safety section. You're sending them AEs, excuse me. You'll be sending them SAEs, for example, if they want them. You'll be sending them SUSARs and any updates that are happening in the study, you will be sending them. Importantly, you must report to them any changes in the research activity that may have an unexpected risk to the subjects. So if there's any unexpected risk or change that has occurred, let the IRB know. Remember, you cannot make any changes in the research without the IRB approval. And I mentioned that in one of our lectures. The IRB has approved your protocol to, to you to be run in the way the protocol is saying. You cannot deviate from it unless it's necessary to eliminate a hazard to the subject. Then you can deviate. Otherwise, follow the protocol. protocol. Okay. And IRBs can ask for lots of documents, whatever you know, they want. If they want these documents, you make sure you are responsible that you provide this to them. Now compliance with, and this ties nicely is compliance with the protocol. Again, just to highlight, and ICH is very clear on this, you should not implement any deviation from or changes of the protocol without agreement by the sponsor and without prior documented approval from the IRB of an amendment. So if, for example, the protocol needs to be changed, it has to be amended. Before that amendment is actually implemented, the IRB has to approve this. You can only implement a deviation when it's necessary to eliminate an, an immediate hazard to the trial subjects or when the changes involve only logical, logistical or administrative aspects such as a change in the telephone number, such as a change in the name of a clinical study monitor. That's administrative. It's not going to impact the safety of the trial, the integrity of the data, or the safety of the subjects. Now, if you do deviate from the protocol, it has to be documented. You will document this and explain why you deviated. Now, if, as soon as possible once the deviation you have implemented deviation or a change which has not been approved by the IRB which has not been approved by the sponsor you must document this and you must submit it to your IRB and let them know what happened and if there's an amendment they will either approve it or not you must submit it to the sponsor if there's going to be a deviation and get the agreement 
and if required, the regulatory authorities may need to know about this as well. Yesterday, we talked about investigational product. Very importantly, you should be thoroughly familiar with the use of this. Only use it in accordance with the protocol and it should only be used for the clinical study, nothing else. I'm not going to say more about that because we talked about that yesterday in a lot of detail. Now, what about informed consent? Very important. Section 4.8 of the GCP guidelines talks about informed consent, and you must follow this section. A little highlight to you from this section, just to refresh your memories. You will obtain ethical approval of the consent form prior to implementing the consent. So the consent form cannot be used until the IRB has approved it or given us the approval. Okay. You must obtain informed consent before any study related procedure is conducted in the subjects. And you must provide sufficient time to the subjects to make the decision to participate. You're not going to pressurize them. If they want three days, let them have three days. And when you're having these discussions with the subject, not only the consent form should be in a language that the subject understands, but the discussion has to be in a language the subject understands. And the consent should not contain any language that waives or appears to waive the subject's rights at all. So very, very transparent. And I'm not gonna say more because we talked about this in our previous lecture. So we're looking at, you know, when the study's up, up and running, there's a lot of communication going with the IRB. You're making sure your study team is always informed, your study team is trained, is, is uh, qualified, and all tasks have been delegated to them. You're making sure, for example, the IP is being handled, being delivered as per the, or being used as per the protocol. Reports. Now, IRB says that you must submit written summaries of the trial to the IRB at least annually. So if it's a long trial you're doing, two, three, four year trial, at least annually, you must submit a written summary. If the IRB says we want it more frequently, for example, every three months, then that's fine. But the minimum is a year, is annually. Now what goes inside this written summary, ICH doesn't give you any guidance. Usually the IRB will tell us, this is what we want to see, for example, number of subjects screened, number of subjects enrolled, what was the side effect profile, any issues, etc. That's the report they want, you will give them that report. Also, you must promptly provide written reports to the sponsor and ethics committees where applicable and the institution on any changes that significantly affect the conduct of the trial and or in increase the risk of the subjects. So let's say, for example, you know, if um, your, study, your study team has left, they've all decided to leave, go to other roles or something, well, that's a significant change. You must let the sponsor know that there's a new team coming on board and also let the IRB know I have new, new members on my team. So that could be something. So there's a little bit of communication going on there with the IRB. What about safety reporting? Yesterday, uh, a, few, a day, couple of days ago, we talked about AEs and SAEs. So serious adverse events, very importantly, you report them within 24 hours to the sponsor. ICA GCP says immediately, but generally it's accepted within 24 hours of you becoming aware of the event, you must report it to the sponsor. Now, if it's a serious adverse event, remember I said there was there were, it was, there were quite a few pages to the, to the uh, serious adverse event form. You may not have all the information to complete all the pages, but what information you have at that moment, you complete this and you send it over. And then you can follow this up with the other additional information that is being asked for. Very, very important. Something important here, GCP says, talking about confidentiality is that your immediate and follow-up reports should identify subjects by unique code numbers assigned to the trial rather than the subject names or any personal identifiers. This ties in very nicely with data confidentiality and protecting the rights and confidentiality of the subjects.
all adverse events, for example, lab abnormalities that are identified in the protocol as which are going to be critical to safety should be reported to the sponsor as per the time periods specified by the sponsor. So SAEs, it's very clear within 24 hours. But what about adverse events? How frequently should we report those? Well, the protocol will tell you how to do that. And usually they'll say, this is just an example, within three days or two days of you becoming aware of the adverse event, you document this in the case report form. There is no special mechanism of faxing or these adverse events to the sponsor. It's only serious adverse events. Okay. Now, sadly, what can happen in clinical trials? Yes, patients, they can die. And if the patients do die as a sponsor, IRB investigator, we will ask you for additional information. For example, we may ask you for the autopsy report and any other medical records. We would need to know that kind of information just to understand why the subject died, if required. So happily, you know, we're doing a trial. There's lots for us to do, and there's still a lot, lot more we would need to do. But GCP talks a little bit about suspension of the trial. When can the trial actually be suspended prematurely? Okay. Now, the trial can be suspended prematurely or even terminated for a number of reasons. And these could be, for example, there's a safety issue with the drug. And the drug is, too, is probably too toxic. It could be, for example, an interim analysis was done and it was shown that the drug is not effective. We can suspend the trial. Or if there's non-compliance by the investigator, then the sponsor can suspend the trial at your site. So that's a very important point. You must follow GCP. When I say non-compliance, I mean non-compliance to GCP. So what if the trial is suspended or terminated? Very importantly, promptly inform the trial subjects that this trial has been suspended. If it's in your phase two, phase three type of the trial, the sponsor will give you specific directions as what to do and how to address the subjects, how to manage the safety of the subjects. They will give you that information. They will make sure that there's appropriate therapy and follow up for the subjects. They'll work with you on that. And very importantly, where required, they will also let the regulatory authority knows that we have suspended the trial or terminated the trial and the clear reasons why they did it. So this can happen. Now, what if you as an investigator terminate or suspend the trial without the sponsor's agreement? What if you, you're doing the big trial and you at the trial don't want to do this trial anymore, you stop it, you suspend it? ICH allows you to do that. What it says, importantly, inform your institution. So you let your hospital institution infrastructure know, I'm not doing this trial anymore. Very importantly, let the sponsor know why and let your IRB know why you, you've done this. Okay? And very importantly, they want a written explanation. So if you decide you don't want to be part of this trial, you're terminating your participation in the trial, there has to be a written explanation as to why. And this goes to the sponsor and this goes to the IRB as well. What if the sponsor terminates or suspends the trial? Then what should you do? Very importantly, so the sponsor will tell you we are suspending the trial and they'll tell you the reasons why. Very importantly, you again need to let your institution know that we've suspended the trial and promptly inform the IRB and very importantly, give them a detailed written explanation as to why. When the sponsor terminates the trial, they will very, very clearly, number one, think of the subjects, how the subjects are going to be managed in this, because that, the safety of them, the rights, integrity of them cannot be compromised at all. So they are always number one, whenever the sponsor is handling the clinical trial, the number one people for them are the subjects. Now, what if the IRB terminates or suspends the trial? The IRB has the authority to actually withdraw their approval at any time point. And they can do that for a number of reasons. For example, you know, if you see safety reports going, they see safety reports going to them, and you know, the sponsor still wants to continue with the trial, but they feel, you know, 
this is not good, we're going to withdraw our approval, they will withdraw their approval. They can have, they, if they wash, wish, they can discuss this with the sponsor because the sponsor would want to know why they're doing this. So if that happens, which, you know, which can happen, again, let your institution know if it's applicable. Very, very quickly, let the sponsor know because the sponsor needs to know why they're doing it and the sponsor needs to put a plan of action in place as to how to actually address the safety and manage the subjects. And very importantly, they would want to know a written explanation for, of the termination of the suspension. So the IRB can do that as well. Another reason IRBs can sometimes suspend a research is the IRB has the authority to come and actually visit your site and see how you're conducting the trial. They can come and do like a little compliance review, for example. And if they feel you're not following the protocol properly, you're not following GCP, you're not sending them the safety information or the reports they're requiring, they will actually withdraw their approval. They have the power to do that. So lots can happen as we move along in the clinical trial. A lot of the obligations we've talked about, and these were some additional ones. Now, when the study is actually running, obviously the study will end at some time point. And when the study ends, as an investigator, I say, says, upon completion of the trial, you must send a final report to the investigator, and sorry, a final report to the institution if it's applicable, and provide the IRB with a summary of the trial's outcome. And that is your obligation. These reports which you're sending to the IRB, to the institution, to the sponsor, for example, are all essential documents. All of these are identified in section eight of the GCP guidelines. They are all over there. And if next necessary, if you're taking on the role of a sponsor investigator, you could ask, you would have to notify the regulatory authorities as well. But if it's a big international trial, and the trial has come to a completion, the sponsor will notify all regulatory authorities that the trial has now come to a completion. Okay, okay so that is in addition to everything else we've been talking about, some of the key investigator obligations. Now, this is what GCP is saying about this. Okay, so GCP is saying clearly identifying this and telling how, you know, what needs to be done, needs to be done. The challenge actually lies if you know we're new to clinical research is how do we do this and that's the next challenge you know we think we need to be addressing is when we're moving towards research is how are we going to implement good clinical practice so what i'd like to do is just wrap this little session up now and you know you do a little recap of the objectives so i hope you understand the definition of investigator sub investigator section 4.0 talks about investigator obligations and you understand your roles and responsibilities of the investigator as per ICA GCP. And uh, very importantly, all of your obligations are clearly documented in section four. So now what I thought I'd do is, same as yesterday, is I'm gonna just, before taking questions, I'm gonna pose a question to you all. And I'd be very interested to know your thoughts on this. So the question is, you have been approached by an international pharma company to participate in a phase three study of in colorectal carcinoma. Now, I want you to tell me what do you need to consider before deciding to be part of this clinical trial? And then we'll try to tie this in. Oops, sorry, I'll bring that back. We'll try to tie this in with what GCP is saying. So what I'll do is I'll start my video again. And, you know, I'd be more than happy anybody who is um, wishing to contribute or, or to start off. Uh, just, uh, they can raise their hand. If you have the answer, please raise your hand. We have uh, Dr. Muhammad. Dr. Muhammad. Please, can you be a little bit loudy? Yeah, um, I think in order to be uh, involved in a clinical trial, I need to study my qualifications. And but, uh, the uh, first of all, I need to be convinced by the investigational product that I'm investigating at first. Second, 
Yeah, that's one. Second are my qualifications and the qualifications of an institute that I'm working on. Third is the size of the cohort that can I afford. Fourth is the qualifications and the size of my sub-investigators on such a trial. Beside, if the trial itself goes parallel to the pathway of our IRB uh, in our institution or not. So, uh, and besides the, the total financial outcome of the sponsor would be enough for my trial or not. Okay, Again, so. safety would be the preferred to consider in this issue. Okay, yes, I definitely like that. So first of all, Ian, it's a very good point you made here is, you know, you need to look at, do you have the team to do this? Yeah. Now you want, you know, whenever you approach to do a clinical research, read the protocol very, very carefully. Yeah. And you're right. First thing is, you know, are you, you know, are you actually interested in the product as well? Do you think this product is good, the investigational product? But importantly is, you know, I read the protocol and using the protocol, there's one aspect which is very important, one um, page, which is called the schedule of activities or this. Uh, and it's a schedule which shows you each visit, what the subject has to go through, what measurements, assessments need to be taken. And this is very important because this is going to take a lot of your time when you're actually seeing the subjects. So how long does it take to inf do informed consent, for example? How long will it take me to do each one of these assessments of the subjects? So you will look at all of this. It's a very good point you've made over there. Yeah. And also you need to consider is, you know, would my IRB be interested in this? You don't know. You know you'll have to think of that as well. Well, so yes, I like that. That's a couple of very good points. And the others I'll, you mentioned, I'll come to in a very short while. So I think there's somebody else um, who's, um, if I stop sharing this, who's yes. actually uh, saying something in. Uh, we missed your screen. It's okay. Oh, do you want me to bring it back? Uh, it's up to you. Yeah, I'll bring it back. Yeah. yeah we have uh, Dr. Abrar. Yes, Dr. Abrar. Yes, Dr. Abrar. Please unmute your microphone. Dr. Abrar. Okay. Uh, Dr. Sharif Urabi. Dr. Sharif. Yes, yes. Uh, I think in addition to the protocol, which is a very important issue, I think I have to consider if I have these patients, uh, the flow of these patients in my practice. Uh, um, I think very important in order to be sure that I have, uh, I, I will recruit the enough patient required. That in addition is, to other points, but uh, this is in my um, mind now. That is critical. And that's the point, you know, you should have the, we mentioned you'll be able to demonstrate that you have the potential of recruiting the subjects. Now, subject recruitment is the biggest challenge you have in clinical research. 80% of studies, clinical trials, fail to meet their recruitment targets. So it's very important, Dr. Sharif, what you mentioned here is you have to look at the inclusion exclusion criteria of the protocol, the type of patient population that is being asked for. Do I have this? You know, do they exist at my institution? The treatment, for example, if you look at, you know, the standard of care, sometimes the protocol is saying they should be having, do they have that or not? Because recruitment can either make or break a study. If you can recruit the right number of patients or the right patients who meet the inclusion and exclusion criteria, you are on your way to success. So that's a very, very good point, Dr. Shreesh, we made over here, is this recruitment. And what you need to do is understand, GCP says, not just recruitment, but in the time period. What is the time period of recruitment? You need to plan this. You know, how will I get these patients? then you need to start thinking, you know, if I can't get these patients at my institution, but I really want to participate in the study, could I get referrals, for example? So this is, I mean, going into a little bit deeper when you're starting to think of, you know, should I have a recruitment plan put in place to make sure I meet the required timelines for the research? So excellent point, I love it. Thank you very much. Is there anybody else who'd like to add something? Mm. Yeah, we have uh, Dr. Muhammad. Mike is yours, Dr. Muhammad. Unmute your microphone, please. Um, uh, one thing I think, uh, does the site permit uh, to conduct a clinical trial? Because we have, yeah, I mean, tertiary hospitals, but they don't allow for conducting a clinical trial on the same site. Um, this is just uh, on my mind. 
okay, I'm sorry, I think, I don't think I understood. Maybe you can repeat that. Uh, I mean, does the site or the institution that I work in permit uh, uh, to conduct oh, yes. technical trial? Yes, yes, very good, yes. Because that's a very, very good point that you made. Will this site allow me to conduct? And why sometimes sites, what, one of the concerns is they want to know about the indemnity and the insurances. You know, what if something happens to the patient in the study? Who is going to indemnify the site? What's the insurance? How, what's, how the subject is going to be handled? And this is something, very importantly, the sponsor will provide. So whenever there's a clinical trial being done at an institution, the sponsor will take the responsibility of indemnifying or providing that insurance, that protection for the site to conduct clinical research. So excellent point made there, thank you. So then again, you have to think, you know, could we actually perform this? Because this is what some of the legal aspects they'll ask in the institution is, you know, logistically if things go wrong, what happens? Then this is actually addressed in a document which we call the clinical trial agreement. So great, great point. Still, we have time because we have Dr. Jamila. Please, yes, Dr. Jamila. Okay. Dr. Jamila. Yeah. Also, we have to take a look for benefit and risk ratio. Yes. Okay. Very good. Okay. Yeah. And usually, what happens, and that's a very good point. You know, sometimes what happens is the sponsor thinks, you know, they write the protocol. They think they've got a risk, good risk benefit assessment judgment. And in that view, they write the protocol. But when it comes to investigators, if you feel that this is too risky, you know, you don't agree with it, don't participate in the study. Simple as that, you know. If you think it's not safe, what's very important is to feed that back to the sponsors that they understand lots of views of people. You know, maybe this is not right and give your views why you think the risk benefit is not very good here. So. Excellent, excellent point made there as well, the doctor. And this is, uh, Dr. Jamila, when you're doing, when you're initially getting the protocol, you're reviewing this. You're going to review the population. You're reviewing the study. You're reviewing the safety. You're reviewing the risks. So wonderful. Thank you, Mr. Naim, uh, for uh, your kind answers. Uh, we received one question now from Thank one you. of the audience. Uh, yes. uh, this might be a small deviation from the primary subject, but at the end of a, of a clinical trial, who will have the right of authorship of the paper coming from the project? Who? Is it the sponsor whom will decide or will it be agreed on in advance in the investigator sponsor agreement? Okay, very, very good. Now what happens is in every protocol, there's, gonna, there's a section there according to GCP on publication policy. And the sponsor will decide what the publication policy is. And they will make it very transparent and very clear that you know who is going to be the author, for example, on the paper. And what they will do is you know, the sponsor will make that decision as to who's going to author, who's going to be the you know the, the named people on the paper. But what they'll do is they'll actually follow the one of the things they have to follow is the ICJME guidelines. I can't remember what they say, the International Journal of medical editors guidelines for example you know, when they're writing publications they will follow those but when it comes to the policy they will decide who is going to be who will be uh, on the author on this bottom line the data is going to be owned by the sponsor because it's a sponsor's clinical trial it's their data and they will say decide who does the publications so i hope that answered that question it will be very transparent clear in the protocol okay another question um is the side effect of medications is a kind of adverse event? Yep, side effects is the layman's term for an adverse event. Yeah, so all side effects are actually adverse events. That's correct. Yep, so adverse event is the GCP term for side effect. Perfect. Okay, another question. Uh, I am aware of a few randomization websites which help in clinical trials. However, um, are you aware of any platform or websites which are most holistic and include the different roles of investigators, data monitoring committees, and other people involved in trials, and that might automate some of the process required by GCP? Now, how are you? I'm not really aware of any of the. What usually happens is, you know, when sponsors 
are going to use any kind of randomization system. It's usually customized for their study. They'll go to some specialist company who will develop this. Yeah. Now you're talking here about data monitoring committees. Now data monitoring committees is something which is very different from any kind of randomization kind of procedure and include the different. Uh, and uh, when you talk about randomization, we're looking at randomizing patients so not randomization to, for example, investigators or things like that. I hope I understood this question correctly. Yeah. So, but I'm not aware of any type of, you know, websites or platforms myself, but they are, when sponsors do this, they do look at the number of big companies which are providing this type of facility. Yeah. Okay. Um, now another question, uh, what is the factors that play a role in the sample size? I think the, they talk about power analysis here. Okay, power analysis, sample size, oh boy. I must say I'm not an expert on statistics at all, to tell you the truth. But uh, there, you know, there are lots of factors which will play a role depending on what the diseases are and what you're looking at and what your endpoints actually are. So there can be lots of factors in the different areas. And uh, it's difficult for me to actually give you more detailed examples because um, I must admit I'm not a specialist on this. I'm a specialist on the GPP aspect, if that's yes. okay. Yes. Uh, another question uh, for informed consent. If the subject is illiterate, deaf, or blind, we can recruit him and who will sign the consent? Exactly. If it's deaf, illiterate, if it's illiterate, deaf, or even blind, then remember we need these impartial witnesses coming in. Yeah. We need an impartial witness for this. Someone who is impartial to the study, to the you investor. Covered, study. You covered that brilliantly in the last uh, webinars. Uh, one more thing. It is a phase uh, three trial, pre-marketing critical phase. Then I need to study the previous two phases. Well, prior to approving my involvement? Not at all. No, no, no. Well, so if you want to get involved in study, you can get involved in any phase of the study. Mm -hmm. What you will have before you get involved in the phase three, let's say phase three study, the sponsor will provide you the information of what's happened in the phase two studies. They'll have the results for this. They will have them. And that all information will be in the investigator's brochure for you. So you do not have to go through phase two, then you go into phase three. No, you can go into any phase at any time point. The earlier phase trials, like phase one, a high risk trials, very concentrated. And uh, about phase two, phase three, any times you can, you can actually enter those, do those trials. Okay, um, this is another question. Uh, I have a question outside of this webinar contents and but link to the subject. What are exactly the difference between PP and ITT population? And okay. which group results will be more credible at, at the end? Okay. So PP is, uh, I think this uh, per protocol definition, ITT is intention to treat definition. And what happens is you have to look at the protocol as to how they're identifying it. For example, intention to treat maybe those, whoever signed the consent form was on an intention to treat population. Okay? And then when we do an analysis, we'll include everybody in there. But a per protocol definition is maybe who's completed a certain number of, of cycles of treatment or classes of treatment. So that really depends what, what it is. And you know, I can't give you what is more credible at the end, et cetera. It really depends how the sponsors are going to be handling the statistics and what's documented in something we call the SAP, S-A-P, which is the Statistical Analysis Plan. So this is going to be a section which is part of the protocol as well. That's great. Uh, another question. Uh, just a moment. Please. Yes, here we go. Um, regarding the trial, if it's multinational, do we need multiple uh, IRBs? Uh, I think he meant he meant IRBs uh, approvals. Exactly. Or only one will cover them within the same country. Okay. This depends on the infrastructure of the IRB in your countries, for example. That really depends. In some countries, you have many, many IRBs, and each institution has an affiliated IRB, and they will get their approval. But in some countries, you, more have, a, you have more of a centralized procedure, where there's one IRB, or like a central IRB, for example, and you just do a submission to that IRB, and that provides approval for all the sites within its jurisdiction. So what happens is you really have to see what is the infrastructure of IRBs, which is in your countries. So that's, that's the answer, answer there. Okay. Uh, is there a good uh, clinical practice course exam uh, the same in every country? 
Okay. Okay. So there are lots of GCP courses in the in the countries, but the best one I have to say is my course, I guess. Exactly. The, <laughs> uh, a bit, of a bit of marketing for myself. No, so, <laughs> so they all of them address GCP and they all address what's in the guidelines. They cannot deviate from them. So they are there. I guess, as I mentioned, the exam is not a necessary requirement. It's part of an understanding. And however you want to do this is part of like, for example, my face-to-face -face GCP when I do classroom GCP, I have an exam in the beginning and I have an exam at the end. And people have to pass that to get the certificate to check the understanding. So that's something over, over, over there. Totally agree. I would, like to, I would like to ask you if your participant uses a drug that expired already three months ago, and we all know that after six months from the date on the drug box, it will still be effective, but not 100%. How this would affect your, uh, your trial and how uh, would you act if you discovered it Ooh, later on? Later on, okay. So this is, this is a quite a little bit of a big problem and has a number of different repercussions here. Yeah. First of all, you know, we'd ask is, you know, as an investigator, why did you not know that it was expiring? Because remember, one of your obligations is to make sure the drug is going to be as used per the protocol, it's stored, etc., in the right condition. And, and uh, if we know it's not effective, but not 100% effective, then what happens is if the subject, this is the question which comes in, if the subject has an effect on, let's say, a side effect, an adverse event, or even a therapeutic benefit, can we 100% say that that was actually due to the drug, the real drug, or because the drug had expired? So, and that was causing the effect. So the question here lies is in, on the integrity of the data which we'll get out of here. And what happens usually if these kind of scenarios happen, what the sponsor actually does is how they're gonna report this. In the clinical study report, when they analyze the data, they will have to account for these and explain these. They can do subset analyses, for example, of this. Yeah. So this here, again, is an example of maybe the investigator oversight was not very good if the drug has expired and the people had still been taking it. Okay. Uh, uh, another question. Um... Uh, does, uh, does uh, I mean, does IRB will decide according to the type of clinical trial, the needed number of subjects who are supposed to be in the trial? No, nope. that's a decade. So the sponsor decides how many subjects they want in the whole study. So for example, they may say 4,000 subjects. Right? That's their decision. And that 4,000 number has been based on the statistical, you know, the power of the study, et cetera, uh, is, yeah. based on that. They, with the sponsor, will decide how many subjects they want from you. They will say, look, we only need from you 20 subjects. Yep, that's what they'll say. Or they may say, we just want two from you. That's a sponsor decision. Because what the sponsor does, they have a plan. They know which countries to go to. They'll know where they want to do the study. And they'll try to get all the numbers. What really happens in life is, as I mentioned earlier on, recruitment is a big, big challenge. And we kind of hit the recruitment. Usually what happens, then we start getting a lot more sites. A lot of sites start joining when the study is already running. So you can join the trial at any time point. And that was one of the questions which was asked over there was, you know, you can join the trial. If the study is ongoing, you can come in new and start the trial. So that can actually happen. Okay. Uh, if the subject decided to get out from the study and inform um, uh, the nurse, what sequence should be done? Okay. So what happens is it'll be clearly written in the protocol, the steps to take when subject withdraws from the clinical trial. So the protocol has a section in there which says withdrawal from study and what needs to be done. So one important thing really is, you know, they'll say, you know, get the medication back, do a safety assessment on the subject, then maybe four weeks later, see them again to see if they're okay. So they're clearly documented in the protocol, the steps for withdrawing subjects from the trial. Great. Uh, now we're gonna take the last question. After that, Mr. Ahmed, uh, gonna need two minutes to explain things to the audience. Uh, when we are taking the consent, should we consider the language of the sub-investigators or only the subject? 
old language of everybody, the sub-investigators must be able to, or whoever is taking consent from the subject must be able to speak the language that subject will understand. So for example, if I'm in, in the Middle East, I can't speak Arabic, the sub-investigator must be able to speak fluent English if they're going to be able to take consent with me. Thank you so 